Hi, good afternoon. Um, just continuing with our session on the unit operations management. We're looking at covering today learning outcome three, which basically talks about um, you know the the main reason of understanding how uh, you know, organizations or businesses actually evaluate performance. Now, in the just a brief recap in terms of what we've covered so far. Now, in the first session that uh, you know, when we started this unit, we looked at an overview in terms of why this unit is studied predominantly in the business and administrative uh, course, and we understand that you know every department has operations, and in 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 that particular sense, we need to look at uh, details of where all. Uh, the operations, uh, you know, management is involved or the working of day-to-day -day activities which are required for the functioning of the organization is involved. So in the first learning outcome, what we looked at was predominantly understood the role of operations, started off with the definition. We looked at, uh, you know, various departments, type of job job opportunities, uh, type of roles and responsibilities which people working within this department carry. And then we also looked at how the role of operations as a as a you know as a function is evolving over the years uh, you know in terms of various organizations then we looked at some of the key bits in terms of um, you know how operations are handled uh, we looked at a few industry industries and you know vertical sectors to understand you know how the department structure and you know the culture of the organization actually helps in uh, efficient uh, you know working of the operations department in the learning outcome too, what we did was we looked at basically understanding what's the link between, uh, you know, corporate strategy, uh, uh, business strategy, and also operational strategy, and how you know um, operational strategy is derived, you know, in short from corporate uh, strategy when we look at putting uh, people into this particular department, which look after day-to-day -day working of the organization. Um, we also looked at, um, you know, understanding areas of conflict which occur uh, with, with, within different departments because sometimes you get to see that, you know, certain jo jobs and roles and responsibilities with individuals are shared and, you know, there's a bit of a blame game culture which tends to happen within the organization. So the idea is to clearly identify, uh, you know, the areas of conflict and how to resolve these areas of conflict. And we lastly, we looked at, you know, how the role of, Operations management is becoming very important in uh, you know companies which basically offer services directly to customers. So we looked at examples of IKEA, EasyJet in particular, wherein the entire uh, you know functioning of the organization has been streamlined uh, using the operations department or the operations management as a function to make the organization lean, mean, effective, and very productive. Now carrying on with that particular um, you know theme. What we're looking at doing today is uh, in learning outcome three, we are looking at basically understanding uh, how the performance of, uh, you know, employees or staff, people working within, uh, you know, this particular department is evaluated. Now, in this particular learning outcome, what we are looking at going to cover is uh, two areas. We're going to study two distinct areas. One is to understand the briefly the process of strategic planning and, you know, the development of corporate policy and how this helps in shaping up, uh, you know, the mission and vision and obviously the key objectives for the operations management department. And once we've looked at that, what we will basically do is understand the key performance techniques, uh, you know, which through which, uh, uh, you know, people or managers within the organization actually look at evaluating performance of, uh, of staff or employees. And in particular, we look at understanding the concept of management by objective, which is also, um, you know, called as MBO. And then we will look at, um, you know, the other important technique which is used uh, or which is which is still in use and actually came into um, being used or invented, you know, which is uh, by Kaplan uh, called the balance scorecard in the early 90s and you know how this became very important within the organization to look at um, you know calculating or you know reviewing performance into uh, tangible parameters and then last but not the least what we will look at understanding something called you know key performance indicators or KPIs which could be financial non-financial for an organization and how these are uh, you know alternate methods uh, apart from the MBO and balance scorecard which are used by organizations to kind of you know review and measure the output in terms of efficiency uh, when we look at 
you know, uh, performance management. So let's get on with it. And I've got a couple of slides. Um, this particular presentation has been updated from the one which has been uh, put up on the learner management system. So I'll put the updated copy and obviously forward uh, a handout to you, uh, which will give you some more concise reading about the key concepts that we are looking at covering today. Things like the performance review uh, techniques like balance scorecard, MBO, and also uh, key performance indicators. Now, Briefly looking at when we understand the process of, you know, st uh, we look at the process of strategic planning. What we are looking here is, in short, um, if you look at the slide, you're looking at basically converting the mission and vision of the company um, and looking at incorporating the feedback from customers into a document which is called corporate strategy. Now, that corporate strategy document could be a long term document, short term document, but when it, it's generally when strategic planning is done, it generally tends to be a long term uh, document or a vision document, which most organizations have. And the, the duration of that document to, you know, things which are written in that document needs to, they need to be accomplished and acted out or, you know, rolled out within a span of, you know, two to three years, two to five years, or, you know, five to seven years. In some cases, if it's a very, very large organization, when we talk, talk about, you know, retail organizations or global multi-billion dollar organizations like IKEA, we should look at Tesco, for example, Marks and Spencer. This strategic planning document could be a 10-year document as well. Now, this led, leads to the creation of corporate strategy. And when corporate strategy has been created, what we do get to see is, which is the board or the management of the organization has actually listed out key priorities which will be important for the business and where most of the people will work within the organization to achieve those objectives. Now, that part of the strategy is broken down uh, using a, a, you know, the strategic planning document into three different strategies, which we've uh, spoken about or read about, you know, uh, more or less in the previous sessions. One is a business level strategy, functional strategy, and the third is operational strategy. But slightly different names here is we look at when we say business level strategy, it is marketing strategy. When we say uh, you know, functional level strategy, it is operational strategy. And when we look at um, predominantly, you know, um, profitability or the key goal targets which have to be met, we list them into financial strategy. Now, this particular planning document, which is created and, you know, is more or less existing in all organizations which are successful businesses, leads to further discussion of how the deployment of this policy tends to happen within an organization. Now, because some objectives have been defined in that document, what we do get to see is, for example, uh, an organization might say, okay, we are going to be reducing, say, cycle time by 50%. That means if it takes uh, you know, um, one hour for the production department, or maybe if it's a services organization producing goods and services uh, you know, in manufacturing, if it takes them pr to produce, a, say, a e washing machine, it takes one hour, they're going to try and reduce that by introduction of two new processes and techniques by 50%. That would mean they're going to be looking at a lot of uh, options wherein they could bring in inventory on time, they could increase automation, they could look at maybe uh, semi-assembled parts being brought in. But the idea is they're essentially looking at, you know, in the policy document, reducing the number of time, uh, number of hours or times which is required, uh, you know, cycle time which is required to actually produce that product. Now, in order to achieve that, what they have to do is they have to look at reducing production time, in turn, reducing purchasing time. So most of these concepts will basically, when it's formed up in the strategic planning document, will have to be made operational or have to be thought of in much more detail of how this can be achieved. And that is what you get to see in the policy document, which uh, you know is prepared after the strategic planning document. Now, once that is done, what tends to happen is that at some stage, these uh, individual uh, you know goals and objectives are assigned to or aligned with the three different forms of uh, you know strategies which are required for it to be bringing it to some sort of a closure or fruition so anything which is to do with bringing in customer feedback anything which is to do with bringing in competition uh, you know comparability or feedback from competition or counteracting competition would come in from the marketing side anything which is looking at efficiency in terms of production reducing cost uh, in terms of you know innovative uh, uh, features being brought out in the product is going to be looked at from the operational strategy point of view and anything which we look at in terms of increasing sales profitability decreasing costs reducing downtime or you know um, uh, looking at things which will help them um, renegotiate you know uh, 
essential pricings or you know as basically more uh, aggressive pricing with suppliers will actually fall into financial strategy now this particular chart here uh, you know on the slide basically depicts the working of the three uh, you know strategies in tandem on one document now what it basically says is human capital organizational capital and information capital is basically looked at uh, you know it gives us all the external information or input points to an organization and then those are developed into processes processes actually produce products if you look at production concept which we talked about in the first part of the uh, you know start of the unit we talk, talked about you know raw materials uh, there is a bit of processing which tends to happen in the factories and then it gives an output and the output is basically the service used by the customers so here uh, most of the inputs which are going to come in in the form of information knowledge uh, you know are going to be fed into uh, a, uh, you know fed into something called a process process will then produce goods and services that will go out to customers but it is dovetailed in that particular language wherein the customers uh, you know are happy receiving those products and services for example you might be you might be going out to the market to buy say for example there but at some stage when you look at purchasing of that uh, you would calculate number of units against the pound that you're paying or the price that you're paying and if the price is not competitive you would probably be tempted to jump to another alternate option uh, rather than the usual product you end up you know normally buying so those things have to be looked at when processes uh, you know work on um, you know raw material to convert it into products and services which customers then buy now when customers buy uh, your products and services you end up generating money and that could uh, help you if the if the slide which typically shows here is that if the products and services are being bought in high numbers then obviously it will help you become a market leader uh, sometimes you know if you're making good amount of profit on the product line it will help you generate more profit and that would mean that you know uh, more money could be invested by uh, by the company into R&D and at some stage you know that leads to the creation of some sort of a value for the shareholder which are given out as dividends or you know at the end of the year uh, kind of fuels the uh, you know the earnings per share or dividends given out to the shareholders now <clears throat> after broadly understanding this let's look at why uh, performance is important and how performance is evaluated so the context of understanding the first two three slide was to look at uh, understanding of why uh, where are these um, you know why does the the performance the the question of performance actually arise so strategy leads to development of policy policy leads to the development of something which is operational strategy and that leads to the creation of products goods and services now once that has happened what you need to be able to do is at some stage manage or evaluate, not manage, but evaluate the performance of a, you know, a resource or types of resources. It could be physical resources, raw material, infrastructure, you know, human resource. And the idea is that you want to be able to measure the performance of that particular resource against the set objectives. And that is where we start to get into something called the uh, range of techniques used by organizations to evaluate what you call, um, you know, um uh, what do you call performance now in this context what we will look at is uh, we will look at understanding two techniques in general which basically talk about you know the um, uh, how how organizations end up using performance management uh, you know uh, basically techniques which are used by the organizations to actually measure performance within an organization the first one that we look at is basically called management by objectives now in management by objectives um, you know this particular thing um, in terms of um, its definition you know it it talks about that uh, any any particular uh, you know organization always looks at a very systematic and an organized approach that allows the management to focus on achievable goals and how to best achieve those goals now here so here what we have to look at is understanding how they can be best achieved by using the concept of management by objective now this as a concept came out in the early 1950s there's a bit of a background that i put across in the slide notes uh, you know it was first outlined by uh, you know a renowned uh, author peter Peter Drucker in, in his book, uh, which is called The Practice of Management. And here, what he basically said was that uh, when we look at management by objectives, um, you know, the main 
function of looking at management of objective is that the managers here actually focus on uh, you know uh, something called uh, time and energy that means if you have to do a particular task what that would entail in terms of the time required to complete the task for the action and what would be the amount of money or resources spent slash ie energy to be able to achieve those objectives now according to peter drucker you know he basically uh, uh, thought that you know uh, and proposed that if you look at manage uh, if managers look at managing by objectives then that would mean that they would basically focus on results and not the activity now it's a simple example is if i if from ardwick in manchester i have to get down to rochdale what i would look at is possibly evaluate various routes of how i could reach rochdale probably in the shortest possible uh, time either by car by taxi by driving taking a train or you know uh, other alternative forms of transport now what i'm focused on is the activity of reaching rochdale for a dinner for example if sir, i've been invited for dinner and here you're focused on how do you reach there now because the end result that you're looking at is basically talking about how you want to get there it's something which is more related to something called the fulfillment of an objective because you want to go in for a dinner you don't want to be late and you want to go and reach uh, you know primarily the location on time or before time now the main uh, d uh, the main thing that we look at in terms of mbo is that whenever organizations look at employing or managing uh, you know some of the objectives and using this concept they look at increasing the organizational performance by aligning subordinate objectives that means sub objectives or you have main goals and you have smaller goals uh, but the main goals are are the one are the ones which are important so here the organization will look at uh, aligning the major goals uh, you know with <clears throat> the overall uh, goal of the management so that at the end of the day you end up achieving uh, you know the 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 task or basically the result and you're not too focused on the particular task or the activity so mbos are basically set you know if i look at um, mbos they are basically goals and objectives and they are written down and they are uh, written down at each level that means if you imagine a pyramid within the organization what you will get to see is the top management will write down certain goals those goals then uh, will be translated into you know uh, certain objectives for the junior managers or the middle managers and the middle managers will write down their own goals and objectives which then will be translated into uh, you know goals or objectives for junior managers and here all individuals are given very specific aims and targets that means the focus is primarily on uh, individual um, you know when when the goals are written the uh, the main goal is the organizational goal and that is then broken down at, at the individual level in terms of what the individual at what level they function whether it's in the uh, you know bottom of the pyramid middle of the pyramid or the top of the pyramid would be able to achieve uh, working on those aims and objectives now individual managers typically here what they expect is that they understand the specific objectives of the job and which objective is best fit in terms of achieving the overall goal set by the board of directors so example here would be that if you are a general manager assume that you are a general manager and you are managing a team of uh, you know five uh, sales managers now the md of the organization your M, your managing director of the organization is actually set a goal of say at reaching a target of 1 million in terms of sales now the general manager would look at you know obviously he's got five managers so he'll break the target down into 200k for each of the sales managers and at some point in time he will evaluate the idea would be for him to be able to hit his bonus and hit his uh, you know uh, accomplishment of his targets he needs to ensure that uh, you know one he achieves that target set of 1 million in terms of sales now he's not too fussed about that which manager or which sales manager actually achieves more or less as long as he's able to meet the overall figure which has been set by the managing director so here using those objectives what he's ensured is two things one he's focused on the end goal which is basically achieving the target of 1 million and the second is he in terms of planning actually breaks it down saying that okay if i have five people who are working for me then the target has to be broken down equally amongst these managers so that uh, you know he has a very good chance of meeting the goal which has been set by his managing director 
Now, in some cases, what you'll see is the managers, as I mentioned to you, will you know kind of break it down into uh, smaller goals, smaller targets, and you know as long as they see that they are uh, their colleagues are participating in the objectives, they make them you know um, they make them their own objectives. He is he or she is actually fine with that because they are focused on achieving the end goal. Now, in terms of the review, how does how do you think the review typically would happen? So in this case, what will happen is the management by objective is all about setting goals and then a detailed you know, roadmap or implementation is prepared. Now, in those cases, what will happen is the, the roadmap, which is looked at specifically achieving those objectives or key results will consist of things like how do we set across a company-wide goal, which is actually coming in from the corporate strategy. Second part would be to look at, you know, how do we determine individual goals and then how they can be aligned to the corporate strategy. The third part would be how do they collaborate, uh, you know, setting individual goals, but also align them with the overall corporate strategy or the strategy of the company. Then they will look at developing an individual plan or an individual level plan to understand where all they will be able to uh, you know, contribute or you know, make contributions towards the overall plan. And last but not the least, these plans would be periodically reviewed. That means they will be looked at. Uh, the manager at the top level would be looking at reviewing them. Say, if you are looking at achieving this target in a month, he would review the plan maybe or the you know plan of action, which is in terms of how they are approaching his sales managers. The channel manager would review that plan every Monday, so he would primarily put. Um, something into place which will review the whole process going forward till the achievement of the target on a weekly basis or on a daily basis. Now, there are some advantages of using MBO and there are some disadvantages of using and uh, not using and that's the reason why this as a concept has kind of, uh, you know, uh, is in used by a lot of organizations which is also faded away when, when we look at some of the modern day organizations in terms of objectives which uh, you know they look at accomplishing primarily because of the process of globalization now here what we are looking at is so if i have to summarize what is mbo mbo is basically looking at setting uh, you know objectives to be able to achieve or complete that task and here objectives are basically set for everyone from top to the bottom uh, level uh, employee in the organization and each of them should have a very clear understanding of the organizational goals and they should also be aware of their own roles and responsibilities you know and what is required for them to be able to achieve those uh, objectives uh, set by the management now most managers would kind of uh, you know require uh, these objectives to be set but in some cases what does what is practically seen is that sometimes it's the delegation of these objectives have not been done properly and also the empowerment in terms of requirements to complete those objectives has not been given you will feel that the employees generally get demotivated and they do not end up uh, you know using this as a concept within the organization the other thing which then led to the creation of a new concept because of the drawbacks within the uh, you know mbo uh, as a as a technique to measure performance uh, led to the rise of something called the balance scorecard and in the early 90s what uh, happened was that um, the the new study which came out you know by Robert Kaplan and David Norton in 19 early 1992s actually suggested that if you link the employee goals to the company-wide goals of the company then this just not this basically just does not benefit the organization, but also benefits the employee in general who's working on those goals and objectives. And that is where they came out with a technique or an approach called the balance court card. And this basically came into play uh, in terms of you know, one of the other techniques to measure performance management. Now, what is balance scorecard? Let's look at the definition. The balance scorecard is basically, um, you know, a scorecard with or a framework essentially, which was designed to translate organizational mission and vision into an overall business strategy. But at the same point in time, it identified certain very specific goals and also put in checks and balances in place to monitor the performance in terms of achievement of these goals. Now, <clears throat> it was quite ex uh, innovative in the fact that it had it paid very explicit attention to vision and strategy in terms of setting goals and objectives. Now, sometimes when you 
talk about organizations and you you know see organizations from from a news perspective what does happen is that you get to see that sometimes the vision and mission of the company is saying something different and actually the output in terms of how the workers are working or you know what products and services it is producing is totally different from its own vision and mission and this is something you know is different in the case of uh, you know uh, balance scorecard so here what they look at is they look at the the performance assessment of the performance uh, you know of the organization and the resources from a point of view of financial returns which uh, are linked to the main objectives of uh, you know the organization so a balance scorecard approach will primarily look at something uh, in terms of you know when i say something which means they will look at the approach which will overall analyze the uh, you know organization's performance uh, but it will organize it sorry so when i say it will um, analyze the performance it will analyze it in four different uh, areas it is not just going to be looking at employees and not just looking at you know um, uh, managers or resources but it will basically look at a comprehensive approach of you know analyzing performance in four different ways now let's look at these four ways which make up the balance scorecard so here mission and vision is or strategic planning is central to that uh, you know um, reason of looking at performance management because this then translates into four different areas according to balance scorecard one it looks at uh, you know uh, financial performance of the company it looks at customer goals or you know uh, goals which have been set in terms of meeting customer demand maybe the uh, you know the uh, expectation of the customers uh, you know in terms of customer experience satisfaction it looks at the internal business processes and then it also looks at you know how growth can be facilitated within the organization and also within the products and services and profitability or you know financial aspect every aspect of the organization so on the left hand side what you see is a figure which basically has four broad uh, you know pillars and it talks about customers it talks about you know growth it talks about you know financial objectives or performance and then it also talks about internal processes and in each of these four pillars what you will get to see is that goals and objectives are defined to uh, to measure the performance within the organization so goals are then translated into objectives objectives are then measured and then measurement is done against the set of activities which have been carried out to ensure uh, you know that the goals and objectives are are met so at any given point in time what you will get to see is that because it goes to uh, you know the level uh, of measuring the success of the activities it can actually help in pinpointing where exactly uh, what went wrong and because of which the performance of the organization or the department or the product did not come out in time uh, something uh, you know on those lines now here what we will look at is when we talk about the uh, you know the balance scorecard what it also looks at is that it looks at as i mentioned to you in that particular slide it talks about these four aspects of you know uh, converting uh, the four processes which is financial we talked about you know the customer uh, internal processes and also the growth objectives into four broad areas so what it does is it translates the mission uh, mission and vision it communicates that and links it to the organizational goal but the vision and mission then is also linking into the business planning document or the strategic planning document of the company and then most importantly it also incorporates feedback from its customers suppliers partners because at the end of the day what they are trying to look at is they are trying to uh, you know overcome the overcome the shortcomings or trying to learn from the mistakes and those can only be done if you are seeking feedback you know from your uh, uh, from your customers and from your suppliers who are vital to the you know uh, creation of your products and services now these are various ways in which you know some dashboards can be looked at when you look at uh, financial uh, you know data coming out from uh, you know balance scorecard now what i want to be able to do is there is a template that i'm going to share with you and that is a template which basically talks about um, you know um, how balance scorecard can actually be uh, used 
to measure the four pillars that we are talking about. So this particular template, I'm going to email this to you as a handout for you to try out. This is a template which is uh, which has got interlinked sheets, and it talks about you know um, the aspects of how you can create a balanced scorecard for a company. So in this first sheet, what you will see is there are uh, you know there's an index which basically talks about uh, comprehensively understanding the various aspects or inputs which are required for the balance scorecard. If you go into the first sheet, now here it talks about that before you start building a balance scorecard, you need to gather all the uh, information which is strategic in nature uh, to be put across as objectives or uh, you know major goals and objectives which are required to be accomplished. So here there are things like you know current strategic plan you look at annual report and the customer feedback or analysis quality improvement reports and those are all to be listed here once this is done you get into the developmental phase of you know um, um with the developmental phase of you know obviously looking at um developing a timeline of how these goals and objectives will be accomplished so here what we tend to do is basically look at drawing up some sort of a Gantt chart and, uh, you know, kind of order these objectives in, in a particular fashion. The next would be to look at forming a checklist and then you determine the objectives which are going to be divided across the board depending on where you are in the uh, organization. So if you look at a pyramid structure, you'll have leadership team or the top management which will have some broad objectives that they will look at. Then in the middle you have and then at the junior level. And once that is done, you create a further checklist, which basically will branch out these objectives, uh, depending on uh, the structure of the organization. You will establish clear goals. And once you've done these clear goals, what you will do is basically have some sort of a, uh, you know, uh, uh, a marking uh, or a, you know, an observing kind of a template, which will basically say, okay, this has been covered, this has been covered. And to a certain extent, once all these objectives have been put in, what will happen is you will end up having something called a, uh, a strategic map which will talk about the various objectives the four pillars that we talk about the learning and growth the internal processes customers and financial objectives all being displayed onto one particular sheet and last but not the least what will happen is uh, once this has been completed we'll be able to arrive at some data uh, depending on you know the the inputs which have been done and that those can be then neatly displayed, uh, you know, to look at a bit of a measurement uh, scale, which can be created. And this then template, you know, goes on wherein it helps you create card graphs and other bits and pieces. And those are the things that, uh, you know, uh, will allow you to uh, look at this. So this is, a, a, you know, a, a template which has been specifically designed to understand uh, how a balanced scorecard technique works. And, you know, uh, I'm going to just send this across to you for you to be able to use it, have it and trial it out so that uh, we understand how a balanced scorecard can actually work in terms of uh, helping to, you know, kind of summarize objectives, measure and, you know, uh, do measurement and obviously help in achievement of targets and, you know, meaningful targets, uh, which will help you achieve the organizational goals. Now, let's go across to something which is what we are going to, uh, you know, look at would be things like, um, um, you know, basically look at uh, the second part, which is we've understood two techniques, management by objectives, and also looked at, you know, uh, what do you call um, balance scorecard. Now what we want to be able to look at is some of the other techniques which have also originated because of maybe drawback, uh, you know, in, in these techniques. Now, the other bits that we look at is we talk about something called the key performance indicators and the key performance indicators could be, you know, we have looked at an MBO and we've looked at in balance scorecard. We look at a lot of factors to kind of measure the performance of staff, employee, worker, organizational across, you know, pan organization. But when we talk about KPIs, KPIs, you know, are key performance indicators which came across, uh, you know, in the early, early 2000s. Um, and this was something which when it came about it primarily was uh, you know focused on the fact that it measured some of the uh, you know the performance uh, in it provided performance indicators and these performance indicators were primarily uh, can be easily grouped into primarily two types financial and non-financial and sometimes when you have to measure performance organizations from different perspective you know if i'm a if I'm a person working within the finance department, for me, uh, you know, the performance which has to be measured, um, you know, 
at the management level would be from a point of view of how much a cost saving will have I done sales in terms of have, how much percentage of sales have increased or what is the profitability profitability which the organization is having on a weekly monthly quarterly annually basis annual basis so here what we want to be able to do is when we look at other performance measurement systems we look at you know something called kpis which is nothing but uh, you know the key indicators of the organizational performance and they then can be grouped easily into something called financial and non-financial so here what we are looking at is uh, trying to understand that what are the key things which the organizations look at doing to be able to achieve and group these uh, you know achieve the performance or the productivity what they want to reach in terms of efficiency and they look at it from a point of view of you know kpis now kpis focus on uh, you know mostly uh, something which is called you know processes so what kpis will look at is they will look at basically um, um, streamlining or improving the processes within the organization which basically help them to kind of uh, hit those indicators or performance indicators which are required at the management level now this as a concept when we look at you know they look at um, key aspects of you know customer orientation and also look at something called global competition now there is something that we will look at in the subsequent slide which will which will give us an idea that why do we see these performance metrics or the types of performances uh, technique measurement techniques are changing over the years now kpis have become important because of one simple factor that a lot of organizations businesses today face a lot of global competition and the competition in general because it is coming across um, uh, you know uh, which is affecting the activities of the business is something which needs to be countered and here what they look at is they want to look at breaking down each and every aspect of what is affecting the organization into some sort of a indicator so and that is where it originates from is that key performance indicator so when we look at uh, a company being affected suddenly by pricing or you know price uh, competition then this then becomes a single indicator which is affecting the business and it kind of overpowers or looks at you know uh, taking priority over all the other aspects of um, you know things which are affecting the business so let's look at understanding KPI and here what we are going to do is look at the uh, idea of KPIs from a point of view of you know Toyota dealerships this is where actually the concept is originally initiated uh, and you know what they it's a good example if we study how Toyota measures um, you know uh, performance or evaluates performance amongst its dealership using uh, this particular concept of you know key, uh, KPIs so KPIs could be financial non-financial and these are measures which the organizations use to reveal how successful they are in terms of accomplishing you know long-term goals so when we look at um, you know what kind of systems and processes they employ within the organization they kind of you know look at the measurement uh, in terms of the output from these processes to see whether the organization is hitting the goals and objectives set by the management uh, from a point of view of the vision document or the strategy document now some of the things that we look at uh, in terms of streamlining and understanding how the performance of the organization could be measured and you know could be affected is when we look at streamlining and understanding the advantages of process and why the process is such an important factor when we look at some of these Japanese organizations through the example of Toyota now process enables uh, organizations to kind of you know steer their business activity uh, in the direction so that they are able to create value for themselves and also uh, offer value to satisfy their customers now some of the advantages when we look at the process approach is that the you know process approach looks at uh, the whole philosophy of the organization and its functioning rather than just it at the individual employee level so here is the focus is more on the operational efficiency of the whole organization as against the individual departmental divisional or strategic business unit operational uh, you know approach so traditional traditionally when you look at you know businesses uh, imply when they look at functional strategy or when they kind of look at uh, you know marketing strategy what they are looking at doing is they are addressing only uh, a uh, you know a few sides of uh, you know the business but in order to look at um, all the factors what 
uh, modern businesses now look at doing is that in order for them to be flexible, they have to group some of these, uh, you know, challenges which they are facing into some sort of indicators in terms of and then look at forecasting or trend of how this will shape up uh, going forward. It's not something that uh, they can do away with, but what they have to do is group them into individual indicators and then study these indicators to be able to understand how this will affect the business in the long run. Now, sometimes you'll get to see the organizations are quite rigid and because they do not, they are not flexible to uh, you know, adopt this approach, what they do tend to see is that the, the competition actually comes in and takes over and they end up losing market share or you know the companies go bankrupt. So the KPIs is, is focused on understanding the key factors which will affect the business and they look at you know uh, from a process point of view and whether this is going to be long term, uh, short term or whether this is going to be you know something which is uh, uh, going to be affecting the business and then they reorient the strategy to be able to ensure that the indicator which is or the you know the particular criteria which is affecting the business as a whole or the organization as a whole is then monitors as an indicator to and linked to the performance of the company so an example here would be some of the things that we look at um, in in the case of Toyota dealership is that Toyota ensured that the pricing of their models car models when they were sold by dealerships remain consistent across the dealerships but in, as against you know some of the other models of dealership which was followed, what we did get to see is that in order to increase sales, sometimes the dealership at their end could reduce the price of the car or the model of the car in order to promote the sales and achieve the targets. But because that was a short-term thing, which basically meant that a few dealerships were able to achieve, but the others suffered because they lost the sale to the, this led to the creation of something called internal competition. And in order to weed that out, what Toyota did was it basically looked at the whole process of why uh, you know there is a pricing competition war or a pricing war which tends to happen between dealerships and what they identified were some of the key indicators of why this then uh, you know went that went down that route and these things then were studied from a point of view of process and what they did was in order to bring control uh, and uh, control in terms of effectiveness and efficiency of business across all the dealerships they kind of put this approach in of uh, key performance indicators and that is where what they do did is they defined the processes that how the sales would happen uh, what kind of activities which the dealership will be able to do or uh, get into and how they would uh, kind of you know reorient their strategy the marketing communication strategies to be able to reach out to customers so what they did was they created high level descriptors of these, uh, uh, you know, uh, of, 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 of the process that they studied. And what they did was they reoriented everything from, uh, uh, from an organizational perspective to meet customers' requirement. And because it turned out that they measured some of these key indicators or key things which customers were asking for, they were built into what you call the index matrices. And then that led to a creation of solutions which were uh, addressing those issues and concerns from customers as index, key indexes and they then were translated into something called activities uh, to be able to uh, you know activities which were then rolled out at the dealerships to accomplish uh, you know kind of a perfect or a near perfect situation in terms of sales of cars so the customer oriented process leading to the development of essential activities at dealership and then every action having a significant role in accomplishing those uh, you know objectives led to the creation of something called kpi or key performance indicators and here what they did was toyota as a as a company monitored the operational activities of the people uh, you know the dealerships and what they did was they further corrected the internal procedures within the dealerships to ensure that this competition does not happen and then they end up still achieving the whole organizational objective of selling so many cars across the year or from the dealerships and that is why this uh, you know came out to be something called key performance indicators or kpis now the reason why we look at measuring performance and why the shift has happened from mbo to balance scorecard to kpis is that a lot of businesses are now operating within global markets they are sourcing products from different markets and the operations of the products in terms of companies that are happening in different markets. The example here is you see Primark, which sources you know cotton from say a country, the processing of that uh, into cloth happens in Egypt. 
the manufacturing of that happens in Pakistan or it happens, for example, in, um, you know, say, for example, it happens in uh, what do you call, say, Bangladesh, Vietnam, things like that. So you see an effect which is talking about global markets. Uh, they are selling clothes in so many countries. Uh, they are sourcing it from different places. And then the operations in terms of manufacturing production are happening in different countries as well. Now, what this has led to do is because there are lots of processes and targets to be met in different locations to kind of operationalize and also to uh, you know create efficiencies in terms of operation across the organization. This has led to the creation of uh, something called measurement of performance or performance management techniques. And this <clears throat> uh, different techniques, no one technique fits all. Different kind of techniques are used by different organizations in different ways. And the reasons why this is happening is that no particular technique fits, uh, as I mentioned, one particular situation. So in some cases, they have to adopt one kind of technique to measure supply chains. Look at you know uh, where you're working as partners, or you have a lot of suppliers and partners working with you. You have to look at you know uh, uh, a different technique, things like balance scorecard, wherein say the suppliers, the customers, the partners, and the uh, company all are having their objectives fulfilled. Uh, it's not that the, the supplier is losing money and the company is making profit at the expense of the supplier. Um, so all these things, when we look at in terms of, uh, you know, the changing trends in operations are then forcing companies to adopt performance management techniques, which could be at the organization level, at the partner supplier level, or at the contractor level, and also at the employee level. And that's a snapshot that you get to see, you know, across these, uh, uh, organizations is that the, on on these charts uh, two or three next slides is basically showing the changing shape of the organization or corporation so when we look at certain characteristics like you know uh, on a 20th century organization we had normally a pyramid structure you had uh, you know things like um, you know physical assets uh, which is basically physical infrastructure uh, more organizations were looking at you know more and more of organizations working at that point of time was looking at you know internal self-sufficiency that means everything was done internally but in the 20th century what has happened is uh, some part of that has led to outsourcing some part of led, that has led to distributed operations and then because of the advancements in technology it has allowed the organizations to reach out to customers in different geographies same products being sold to different customers uh, which has created, led to the creation of a lot of challenges but also a, a, you know kind of made the whole process of operations quite easier and if we look at it from a point of view of you know some some of the other characteristics when we look at operations 20th century the focus was on vertical integration um, you know but uh, if we look at the 21st century the focus is primarily on you know virtual integration so that means the product could be manufactured in uh, you know china but the designing of the product could be done in the us and the raw material could be sourced anywhere but as long as the customer sees this as one particular uh, you know uh, uh, product coming across from the company branded as them that is something which was uh, you know the customer is happy with and that is something which is virtual integration vertical integration was that you know it involved a combination of one or two more stages of production normally operated with by separate firms horizontal was when you have it within the company vertical is when uh, say companies could outsource some part of it manufacture it and then integrate it uh, in in their setup to then uh, come out with that product so for example car Car manufacturing, when you look at it, is an example of vertical integration because uh, different parts of the car engine are built in different uh, phases in different uh, locations, and then they can be operated by separate firms to integrate into one particular product, which is then you know uh, sold into the market. So, where when we look at these concepts, they have changed from the definition in terms of you know vertical, horizontal has changed to forward and backward integration, and forward and backward integration has also changed now to vertical integration. And this is something which is going across just to showcase uh, with three slides, you know, talking about uh, some of the characteristics in terms of organization, when we look at, you know, the types of operations within the organization. And then when we look at the type of workers or, you know, the different set of people working within the organization, how their roles are actually uh, changing. So, you know, leadership role is changed to transformational or inspirational role. You know, people look at leaders as being uh, providing inspiration motivation you know and those kind of things but in the earlier days obviously the the, the leadership required was slightly different it was maybe in uh, engineering or 
manufacturing organizations pretty much you know you had a very dogmatic style of leadership which meant uh, you know that over the years as the time has evolved what you have seen is that you know the uh, leadership style has changed wherein you're no longer looking at just relying on the principles but you're looking at adapting and quickly adapting to be able to you know adapt to that situation or um, you know adapt to a particular uh, situation within the organization so in general when we look at you know um, this learning outcome 3 what we want to be able to understand is why is performance important uh, why organizations look at performance management what are the techniques or tools that they use for performance management and we look at mbo and you know balance scorecard but that has also led to the creation of something called kpis in the modern day organizations how this shift happening has led to uh, you know organizations then um, adapting uh, to various performance management techniques and that then leading to uh, you know the creation of uh, some of the you know trends uh, basically trends uh, which basically meant that you know global outsourcing globalization and these kind of trends have meant that uh, you know the organizations have to have different performance techniques which can be employed within the organization outside the organization with their suppliers contractors and partners and still get to manage the whole process in terms of making sure that uh, you know their overall goals and targets are met but uh, rather than do it on a piecemeal basis an integrated approach which is then applied to you know um, uh, measure performance operational efficiency productivity whatever word we use but from a point of view of you know looking at uh, pmts or performance management techniques but that's here uh, what i'm going to do is i'm going to stop here in terms of the session for today and that will help us uh, you know complete the learning outcome three for this unit operations management and in order to kind of support what we've discussed on this session i'm going to send across a handout which will cover these two uh, or three most important concepts of performance management technique and the template of kpi uh, sorry the template of balance coca which i showed to you for you to be able to use and you know experiment with it to see how you can actually prepare that for a organize for your own organization and you know use it to measure performance any questions and queries as always you know on on the email uh, do feel free to give me a call and uh, what i will do is if there is any additional uh, resources required uh, like a handout or you need some more uh, you know uh, details on on the topics that we've discussed today i'll be more than happy providing that to you uh, as and when required right thanks for joining in this session today and i what i will do is catch up with you next week